I'm pleased to welcome here, uh, you here today. Where we're hosting one in a series of Nixon Legacy Forums, which explore the various policy initiatives of our 37th president, Richard Nixon, who was elected in 1968. We at Franklin and Marshall College are especially honored to be hosting this particular forum since it focuses on the work of the Ash Council, whose executive director, Andy Rouse, is a graduate of Franklin and Marshall College, a history ma uh, major and member of the great class of 1949. It has been said that it is leaders who have made history and not history that has made leaders. Real people like Andy Rouse are the ones who make the decisions, take the risks, develop the innovations that we later study as history. Here at Franklin and Marshall College, we have our own history as a 226-year-old institution built by the innovator and statesman Benjamin Franklin and named also for the great Chief Justice John Marshall, established with the mission of bringing into practice the audacious idea of American democracy. And a continual reminder in a society woven of many strands, it is through education that we create strength and unity and national purpose out of our multiple strands. Franklin and Marshall College's history has been forged in the great American educational tradition of finding and cultivating talent and then launching that talent as new leaders into lives of meaning and impact. Andy Rouse truly embodies that tradition. and We are so pleased to be able to honor and hear from him today. Now let me introduce our discussion leader, Jeff Shepard. Jeff served on the Domestic Council in President Nixon's White House and is the producer of these legacy forums. He lives not far from here, just outside Philadelphia, and is a graduate of Whittier College in California and Harvard Law School. Jeff, thank you for your service and for being here today. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Franklin and Marshall College. Thank you. Thank you, President Porterfield. Uh, we've done over two dozen of these legacy forums, and they're co-sponsored by the Richard Nixon Foundation and the National Archives. What they amount to is group oral histories. What we do is get the people who wrote the documents who made the historic record to talk about what they set out to accomplish. And what we found is in the discussions or in the interplay between the people, we get a better work product than individual oral histories because ideas occur or judgments are, are met, made on the stage in the course of these forums. Today's focus is a very special one because the work was done so early in the Nixon administration. If we had to do these forums over again, this would be among the very first of them because it set events into motion that resulted in very significant changes. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We all know about the Nile River. The Nile River runs the full length of Egypt. Uh, a huge impact. But if you're in, in search of the source of the Nile, you keep going back up, 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 past the Aswan Dam, to a little trickle where the Nile really starts before it becomes a mighty river. That is an analogy for today's Ash Council. We're going we're to talk about an organization that got started very, very early in the Nixon administration whose recommendations led to significant changes. Now, I'm going to cover a little bit of background uh, on how we got there so we can have a good discussion with Andy. Uh, it was President Roosevelt who did the first reorganization act. It was passed in 1939. Uh, uh, it, it had to do with, with rationalizing the buildup of all the programs that were passed in trying to uh, combat the Depression. Reorganization plan number one in the act of 1939 created the executive office of the president. The president's not just his personal campaign staff, but a group of knowledgeable people to help the president to run the executive branch. That act existed for two years and set up a situation that, that was a legislative veto where the president could propose organizational changes and they became law in 60 days if the Congress did not veto them. And that uh, uh, setup is what's continued through and resulted in the creation of the Ash Council. In between, President Truman in 1949 renewed the act, the Reorganization Act of 1949, and and it was renewed sporadically on this two-year basis. Uh, 
so he could put in legislative proposals and, and have, them, have the reorganizations come into effect. When Nixon came into office in January of 1969, one of his first messages to Congress, dated January 30th, was asking Congress to renew this authority, which had expired, so he could do reorganization acts. And then, of course, the, the Ash Council followed uh, uh, and, and, and led us to, to really the changes that we're going to describe today. But let me give you a hint of, of what's to come so you can follow. The Ash Council, for the most part, is talking about a proper organization, and I'm going to say in a sterile environment, Andy, Andy may disagree, but it's, it's, it's how you build a clock. You know, you see all the gears and you cut them and you understand how the pendulum works, and, and that's how a clock could fun should function. That's how the government should be organized. But you're dealing with people, and, and those aren't clock gears, those are real individuals with personalities and attributes. And what we're going to find is when you went through and took reorganization proposals and agency creation ideas and involved real people, things changed. And that's going to be the fun of what we're going to walk through. Now I'm going to go to our, our first slide and just give you the key dates and we'll go th through them very, very quickly because we want to get to what we are actually doing. Uh, uh, the President asked Congress in uh, January 30th, this is the same month he's inaugurated, this is uh, eight days after his inauguration, for new organization authority. He appointed the Ash Council, or at least it was announced on April 5th. Uh, they met with the President fairly early on, and Andy's going to describe that in a few minutes. And then in 1970, there were four reorganization proposals that became law. And the Council finished its work less than a year and a half later, in August of 1970, but one of the aftermaths was the, a, a core pillar of the President's State of the Union. Now, if, as I say, the Ash Council was so special and did so much, why don't we know about it? Why don't we, uh, uh, why doesn't it appear in history books? How come it isn't better known? And that's shown on this next slide. And we came across this memo when we were preparing this program today for the Ash Council. You can't read it, but I've read it. It's a memo from Andy Rouse in, uh, uh, as they're closing down in late 1970. And, and Andy writes to Bob Haldeman, the president's chief of staff. And Andy's the executive director, and he's closing it down. He says, what, what, what should we do now that we're closing down the Ash Council? And, and there isn't going to be a final report. What we're going to do is take the 13 confidential memos that we've written the president, over the course of our existence, and we're going to put them together in a book for the members of the Ash Council. But what should we do with the records? And, and he gets a note back from, from Bob Haldeman, it's in his handwriting, and the instruction is these memos have to be closely held. These were written for the President's eyes alone, and they're critical of some of the existing organization. So we're not going to put them out for the press to cut up one side and down the other. We're just going to bury them, and there isn't going to be a publicly released report. Now, that's what brings us here today with Andy. Andy was in it from the beginning. He, he was president at the creation, president at the end, came on the staff to help effectuate what those recommendations were. Uh, uh, and what we have is his institutional memory in addition to the documents that exist here at Franklin and Marshall and at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda. So let's turn to Andy. Here we have the members of the Ash Council. Andy, take us through them. Um, you know, we have a picture of these guys. Yeah, they're next. We're going to do them by name first. Um, Roy Ash, uh, as this notes, is the president of Lytton Industries. But he had been one of the early um, protégés of Bob McNamara and was uh, very much involved in the whole area of systems analysis as it was developed by McNamara. Uh, he left that to uh, join Thornton 
in creating Lytton Industries. And at the time that he was appointed chairman of this council by the president, Lytton Industries is one of the hot companies in the country. Its stock was going through the roof and it was the, all the, the rest first of it. real conglomerate. Well, after after uh, uh, tech, uh, Textron, probably. Okay. Right. In any event, uh, Ash was a fairly significant fundraiser for the president in California. And while they were not friends, they were well acquainted. George Baker was the dean of the Harvard Business School um, and had spent his entire life in academia. He was a very thoughtful individual, but he was a, a man who folks would characterize as, I think, as a Rockefeller Republican. That may be a term many of you are not familiar with. And there are very few of them left today, but they were moderate Republicans. John Conley is fairly well known because he had been the governor of Texas. He was the, the man who was wounded at the same time as President Kennedy was assassinated. He was in the car, in the same car with, right. with uh, Kennedy because he was governor of Texas. Right. Um, and he was a Texas Democrat which today translates as a member of the Tea Party or something close to it. Uh, he was a very conservative Democrat, and as we'll hear later, he and the president uh, were, had quite compatible ideas about how the Republican Party might evolve. Fred Kappel was the chairman of AT&T, which was the largest company in the country at the time, that is uh, in capitalization terms. Uh, he was a self-made man, started life as a guy on a telephone pole in the Midwest, and at this point was chairman of AT&T, but he had been, before being appointed by the president to this job, the chairman of the so-called Capital Commission on Postal Organization. That was the organization created by Lyndon Johnson, but President Nixon was the man who actually created the United States Postal Service. Took it out of the government or made it a quasi-independent agency. Right, and that was Capital's work, so he had familiarity with how these commissions worked, and he was, a, he was a, a very thoughtful and a very conservative man. Dick Paget was by far the, well, with the possible exception of Ash, the smartest guy on the council. He was the president of what was then one of the two or three largest uh, business consulting firms in the country, Cresset, McCormick, and Paget. And he, too, was a moderate Republican. Walter Thayer was the last man to be appointed to the council. He was a New Yorker, a fairly major fundraiser in New York for the Republican Party, it was the associate of John Hay Whitney, who was the owner of the Herald Tribune and a whole bunch of other stuff. And Thayer at this time was president of Whitney Communications, which was an offshoot of John Hay Whitney's operations, ran the International Herald Tribune and a bunch of other stuff. Now, we're, we're going to stop here just for a second because I've, I've done the, some of the research on the uh, documentation and, and point out a couple of anomalies in, in the list of people. Uh, uh, the, the, the man who's not able to be with us today is a congressman from Wisconsin uh, named Tom Petri. And Tom was on the staff that, that started with Andy in uh, pulling this together. And, and we spent some time on the phone with him, but he wasn't able, wasn't able to be here. And what Tom told us was that they really wanted Roy Ash to be head of the Bureau of the Budget. Uh, uh, that that was the, 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 the theory of, of Roy's involvement in the government 
but he didn't want to leave Litton Industries at the time. Uh, Litton had grown so fast and the stock price was uh, at such heights and then it was entering into a difficult stage. And he didn't want to put his assets into a blind trust, which is what you have to do when you come to work for the government. So Roy's one of these guys who's kind of in between. I mean, he, he wants to come help, he wants to be involved, but he doesn't want to let go of, uh, of his wealth. And then at the bottom, Walter Thayer, who's announced in the papers as joining in June. This council's named in April, but Thayer joins in June. Thayer was really there from the beginning, but had the same problem. Couldn't legally be appointed a member of this organization because he was doing stuff for Whitney Communications, and he'd, he was really a lawyer and he'd made promises to the owner of Whitney Communications that he'd handle those problems before he got involved here, but in fact he was expected to be a member of the, uh, of the council from the get-go. Uh, we don't want to spend too much time on this, but Thayer was actually the organizer of the council because Ash was in California and Thayer was in New York um, and was able to get to Washington easily and in fact took an apartment in Washington and was there pretty much full time during the earlier per um, period. So, it, was, it was Thayer who actually hired me and who hired Murray Comero, who was the first uh, executive director of okay. the council. And you were talking about how often you met and, and how the council worked? With Thayer? No, with me before when we were rehearsing for this today. Um, we were rehearsing for this? We well, <laughs> t tell me, tell me how, how the council functioned. Um, the, the council functioned by, like most councils do, by having a staff which did most of the work, produced a memoranda or a draft memoranda, which the council would then consider at meetings, which they held really quite frequently. Um, particularly around the first several of these memoranda, the ones that dealt with the executive office of the president in particular, there were very long meetings. I mean, the meeting which considered the executive office and the domestic council, which you'll hear about in a, in a minute, um, really lasted a full day. And these were very intense meetings. I, I, I remember uh, sometimes the, the, discuss, the dialogue was about matters of substance and sometimes it was pretty petty. I remember one petty one in, in, in particular and that was the spelling, spelling of the word insure. Some insisted that it was I-N-S-U-R-E and others that it was E-N-S-U-R-E. Um, and that became a fairly intense argument. I see. I see. <laughs> um, well, let's go to one of those long meetings. That's where our picture is from. Can you describe this? This is a picture. This is a meeting in San Clemente at the, at the uh, Western White House. And starting at the left, you have uh, John Conley, uh, the, uh, George Baker, uh, Paget, the president. And next to the president is Ash. Uh, I'm sorry, not Ash. Uh, next to the president. Do you have that picture there? Yeah. Should be behind that one. Um, now, if I get up here real close, I Sure. Uh, oh, no, that's Capel. Next to the president is Fred Capel, then Walter Thayer, and finally Ash. Um, this is at San Clemente, and it was a picture taken at the time that um, the council held a meeting out there uh, having to do with the memoranda of the president uh, on the executive office. And this is August of 1969. This is one of the longer meetings. And we have two more pictures, so we, we know where this is going. You want to describe the picture in the upper left? Yeah, this is the conference room in the um, pre president's offices, uh, which I learned this morning were temporary structures. 
and this is the conference room in one of them. Uh, the, the guy, the, on the right, the guy with the glasses is Murray Comero, who at the time was executive director of the council, and that's me sitting next to him. I was deputy at the time. Uh, Comero was an interesting guy. He had been the executive director of the Federal Power Commission and was a very strong and very enthusiastic Democrat. And because he was a Democrat, he had been reluctant to take the job of executive director. But he had come so highly recommended uh, by others, but principally Capel, because Comro had been the executive director of the Capel Commission. Oh, the post, the one right, that did the post that I referred to. And Capel was an strong advocate. And so he agreed to take the job, but he, he, he stuck at it for a year and then quit. Next to me is Fred Capel. Next to Capel is the president. Next to the president is Paget. And then down at the end of the table, and I hope you can see him in the picture. Barely visible. Barely visible is John Ehrlichman. He's in the white coat on the right side. And he's John Ehrlichman, who's famous for a whole lot of things, but at the time he was the principal domestic advisor of the president and one of his top political lieutenants. Across the table from him was the president's chief of staff at the time, Bob Haldeman. He's the one with the burr cut, if you can see him. And then you have John Conley, Roy Ash, Walter Thayer, uh, yep. George Baker, and the one the young man on the left, name escapes me, is, is Richard. He was a member of the staff. He had been the principal author of the draft. On the he, executive office. On the executive office. He's he, prominent in the picture. Yeah, he, he was. He, he was a very, he went on to become a member of the U.S. State Department and became an ambassador to somewhere. Could you tell us a little bit about the meeting, how long it went on and what the discussion was? Well, this was, was a pretty much full day meeting. And it followed the knockdown drag out meeting that the council itself had on the draft. That was the meeting where insure, ensure became yeah. an issue. <laughs> and other things. <laughs> right. Um, and this meeting occurred the next day uh, with the draft of the memo in hand. And you'd already submitted the memo on proposed reorganization of the executive office. Right. And this is discussing it with the president and his top people. Exactly. Um, How much time of the president did you get? Well, it was certainly several hours. Okay. This wasn't a posed picture and then he left. No. It, it, was, it was several hours and it was a, it, it, mostly it was Ash talking at this meeting because um, others made contributions. Um, uh, as I recall, with the exception of Baker. Um, um, but Ash was explaining to the president, as he had explained earlier to Haldeman and Ehrlichman, um, the rationale for the, for the changes. Okay. And the next picture down in the corner? Well, that's the president with Governor Conley, and Paget is walking behind him. And this, this, was, this picture was taken after the meeting that, that we just talked about. And Conley, uh, the president separated Conley out from the rest of the group almost immediately and walked uh, with him um, for quite a while. They had a they stopped at one point and were talking to each other for what I think was at least 10 or 15 minutes while the rest of us sort of milled around behind them. Uh, Conley did not tell anybody what the conversation was all about until many months later. But it was obviously, uh, at least 
we all got the sense that it was something the president very much wanted to do. If, if I may tee the ball up a little bit more, because this is what I dwell on. Governor Connolly uh, was Secretary of the Navy under uh, uh, Jack Kennedy, but a protege of Lyndon Johnson, three times governor of Texas, and very conservative. And this Ash Council exchange, particularly the two-hour meeting in uh, uh, the conference room, is really the first time that President Nixon gets to know Governor Connolly. And what happens is they break for lunch, and, and we know the conference room is at the Coast Guard base, and they've come up to uh, Casa Pacifica, the president's uh, home where the, the swimming pool is. Uh, uh, they, they get off by themselves, and they start talking politics. They're not talking structure. They're not talking executive organization. They're talking politics. And what did you later find out? Well, it's a fairly interesting story. I think we, I was having a lunch in the, uh, in the White House mess with um, Governor Conley. And um, a White House operator named Dent, that was his name, wasn't it? Yeah, Fred Dent. Fred he Dent. He was uh, from South Carolina. From South Carolina passed by, and he stopped to talk to uh, Governor Conley and he, uh, for a moment, and he just said to him, um, the president, you and the president are on the same page with regard to, uh, I'm paraphrasing, uh, with regard to uh, the possibilities for the Republican Party in the South. The South at the time was solidly democratic. Had been. Had been for many years, but it clearly was a very conservative wing of the Democratic Party, it, it, and Conley himself was the epitomization and, of that. And then just to, just to finish, and we'll, we'll move on because this is a, a, a side alley, uh, Conley joins the Nixon administration as a Democrat, as Secretary of the Treasury, uh, convert, it leads Democrats for Nixon in the 1972 campaign, converts to the Republican Party, and uh, uh, when uh, Vice President Agnew resigned and the president was uh, about to pick for the first time a vice president to be appointed and then confirmed by the Congress, he really wanted to pick John Connolly. He really wanted to do that, but the he was advised by the congressional relations people that Connolly couldn't be confirmed because he had switched parties. He, he was a Democrat who had become a Republican, and that wouldn't work un, under the circumstances with the Democratic majority in both the House and the Senate. So he picked Jerry Ford. But John Connolly was clearly Nixon's choice to become vice president, and if not, then to run for the presidency next time around. And it, my view, Andy, Andy slightly concurs, it stems, it stems from this Ash Council exposure. And the, 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 you, you'd have to have known Connolly, tall man, self-confident. Uh, uh, just, uh, uh, I remember when he took over at Treasury, uh, uh, he, he, he could walk into a room and, and, and he'd take over the room. And other people were in awe of him. He was a... Uh, uh, the, the epitome of a man on horseback. So that was Big John. Now, what we have on this slide are the four reorganization plans that became law. Remember, they were uh, proposals that if the Congress didn't veto in 60 days, became law. You couldn't create a whole new department, but you could shift things around. And the first one, the Office of Telecommunications Policy, wasn't an Ash Council. There's no memo by the Ash Council on this. This was done separately, but moved out first uh, and created OTP on the White House staff. And interestingly, both Brian Lamb, who's the founder of C-SPAN, and Mr. Justice Scalia uh, came to Washington to work in that first office, that Office of Telecommunications Policy. And it's how the government tried to get ahead of the uh, uh, developmental curve on telecommunications. But then the second one, and the third and the fourth, are pure ash council. These are the results 
of Ash Council memos, and we're going to spend a fair amount of time on number two. Go ahead, Andy. Tell us about reorganization plan number two. Um, at the time, the management functions, if you can call them that, in the federal government was resonant in the Bureau of the Budget. And the Bureau of the Budget was a really quite expert organization. The best of the senior civil servants and the brightest young men and women in the civil service, one way or another, wended their way into the budget office, into the Bureau of the Budget. We, fairness requires, we point out, Andy was at the Bureau of the Budget. You were running a division. What was the name of the division? The Resources Planning Staff. And, and it did analytical work on projecting financial impact of... Yeah, it was a relatively new staff. It, you know, you, the director of the Bureau at the time is Charlie Schultz. And he had the unremarkable idea that somebody ought to know when you make a, when you put an item in the budget, somebody ought to know what the future costs of that item were likely to be. This was, this was particularly true of defense programs, military programs. It was true of, of most of what was in the budget. There were consequences to creating a budget item. The famous out years. Right, the famous out years. And so he created the resources planning staff to do for the first time long range planning for the federal government. And that's. And you were hired to build that staff and run that function. Right. And then you went from there to the Ash Council. Right. And we're going to go forward one slide to show you the recommendation. And this is a little hard to see. I've got my copy right here for you. Uh, uh, this was the diagram in the Ash Council memo to the President on what they thought they ought to do with regard to his staff. The executive office reports to the President but not through a cabinet officer. So it's really his organization. And what the Ash Council focused on first and was supposed to do was make that, make that more rational. You have to uh understand that at, at that time, the cabinet departments were, if there was anything being managed at all, it, it was being managed by the cabinet departments. The president's office was a political office, and then there was the Bureau of the Budget and all these other things that had But it, it, it was, in, in, in a, a, a fair description, cabinet government. The exactly. secretary of HEW decided what he wanted to do in education, announced it, and followed through. Exactly. And there was no, one of the consequences of that is that, there, that over the years, a lot of conflicts arose between the departments because they were doing very similar things or even when they weren't doing very similar things, they were doing different things, but found themselves uh, clashing with one another. In conflict. In conflict with one another, because the things they were doing were in opposition to one another, in one way or another. It was fairly clear that you needed to bring m more of the direction of of the management of programs, the evaluation of programs, the creation of programs into the executive office. But the Bureau of the Budget was purely a budget organization. It had other functions as well. It did, uh, you know, some legislative, some legislative work. It did some work in reviewing and approving regulatory actions and so forth, but, it, but this larger management role was not performed anywhere in the federal government. And it was Ash's idea initially, but joined in by the other members of the council that the president needed to become a chief executive in fact, and that he needed to have a staff that carried out 
all of the functions that should allow him to unify and to, uh, and to direct the activities of the executive branch. So let's go through these six boxes that, that was the recommendation. We, we, we note it's not called the Office of Management and Budget in the, in the memo. No. The, the, the name of the office, it was called the Office of Executive Management, I believe. It became the OMB as a result of a, of a, uh, a, a dialogue between John Ehrlichman and Roy Ash. Um, uh, uh, Ehrlichman recognized how vital and important and reputable credible the Bureau of the Budget was. Mm -hmm. um, while he agreed with all of Ash's ideas regarding the management aspects, the executive aspects of it, apart from the budget, these other things that we have, coordination, personnel, and so forth, um, he didn't want to uh, subsume the idea of budget under the idea of management. Okay. And so, which, which was true of the term, the Office of Executive Management, which was the original name. And so they compromised on the Office of Management and Budget, which brought both the management ideas, which were so important to Ash, and the budget ideas, which were so much a tradition of the office. But but there's some really aggressive things in this recommendation. Oh, I mean, yeah. he's, he's talking about putting personnel into his office of executive management. This is Roy's idea because Roy kind of pictured maybe someday he'd be running this thing. I don't know why you always, yes, that's true. <laughs> um, um, but he also had a, 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 rash, a, a better rationale for it. And that is that if you're going to manage something, who manages it is pretty important. Um, and so there needed to be some uh, executive personnel activity in the president's office. I mean, if you're going to be an executive, who you appoint to do certain things is you know, so, so it, you, might, you, I mean, that's sort of a duh. But, but it's not, it, it's a change from not just appointing people who gave you money or people who uh, 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 supported your election campaign, it's appointing people who can manage uh, uh, sections of the federal government. Well, there's a nuance to that. You're still going to appoint cabinet officers and perhaps deputy cabinet officers the old way. Um, but in, in the federal government, there, are, there is a layer of executives that starts with the super grades of the civil service and runs through the lower levels of, I guess it's still called Schedule C, is it? Yeah, the, in, in our era, we don't know what it is today, but in our era, super grades were level 16, 17, and 18 of the civil service. And then you had five levels of presidential appointees, cabinet being level one, and uh, 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 lesser important people being level five, which is what I was and I'll bet you were at the time. Well, you, there, Jeff characterizes them lesser importance, but while they were of lesser importance on that scale, they were very, very critical people because they were heading branches and divisions and functions and whatever throughout, you know. Less senior were, people, forgive me. Right, and, you know, sometimes they were managing thousands of individuals. So these were very, very critical jobs. <clears throat> and the point of the Office of Executive Personnel <clears throat> was to help identify these people and also to create programs for their development, training, and evaluation, which would be uniform throughout the, the executive branch. And then they did a couple of other things. I'm dragging you into this, but you, you did it. I just know you did it. Uh, uh, before OMB, if a department went to testify before the Congress, they testified whatever the heck they thought. But after OMB, you had to get clearance before you could testify. And there were three levels of clearance. And, and, and everybody waited for the statement, but only OMB could award the statement. 
this proposal that you were advocating or you were commenting on before Congress was a part of the program of the president, consistent with the program of the president, or not consistent with the program of the president. And the departments and agencies fought, bled, and died with OMB over what they could say on the Hill, but only OMB could award the presidential imprimatur. Now that, that, however, was not done in executive personnel. No, 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 that's one that, of the other boxes. Yeah, that was done in legislation and budgeting, which yep. is by far the largest of these divisions within, because it, it subsumed what had been the Bureau of the Budget. And for those of you who've never seen the budget of the United States, it is a really qu quite awesome document. I mean, it's at least four inches thick. It's the phone book, doubled. Um, and and um, in, in addition to the budget itself, there are supplements to the budget, which themselves are 30, 40, 50, sometimes 100-page books. Um, uh, all of that done in this, this Office of Legislation and Budgeting, and it's still done in the OMB today and makes up the bulk of the actual working time yeah. of the organization. And one of those other boxes is regulator, regulatory clearance? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. the, it, while this is called legislation and budgeting, the regulatory clearance was in here along with legislative clearance and the clearances that Jeff referred to. Now before, you wanted to issue regs under any given law, you issued regs. It didn't matter whether you were uh, the Department of the Interior or Department of HEW. But after, you couldn't issue, you as a department could not issue regs without OMB's clearance. It had to be centrally reviewed. So the president had, the president's people had some idea what you were up to before you could do it. Okay, the third box on here is information systems. The, the, the status of information systems in the federal government at the time was somewhere between a D minus and an F minus. Um, it, I'm not sure it still isn't at that point, but um, the, the, the point of this unit within the OMB was to bring the federal government into the modern age with regard to information systems. Keep in mind, this was over 40 years ago, but computer systems, believe it or not, were existed and they were in their infancy and a lot of companies were doing pretty terrific stuff with them and the federal government wasn't. Um, this office was supposed to uh, create a information system for the federal government, which in various, in one form or another, would be utilized throughout the federal government. Needless to say, that never happened. Uh, um, and I'm really not sure whether this organization was ever established, do you know? No, I don't, I'm, I, that's why I'm skipping it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it was ever established. So I want to draw back a little bit now and go to the big picture, the box of three boxes across the top, which is the, yeah. Yeah, this the, is a, yeah. the essence of the Ash Council recommendation on the executive office. Okay, so the National Security Council was and is and remains the principal uh, foreign policy and defense policy arm of the federal government. It has remained, interestingly enough, relatively stable. Uh, not, not its personnel, obviously, but its function has remained relatively stable for many, many years. Um, sometimes it does more and sometimes it does less, but I think everybody has a very clear idea of what it does. They're but pretty clear. from the president's point of view, who conducts foreign affairs, that's the way the Constitution reads, right. The National Security Council is his staff extracting information from everybody else, meeting with him first time, first thing in the day, last thing in the day, and that's how he runs foreign affairs. Yeah. And then you jump over to the Domestic Council. 
one additional thing, however, on the National Security Council is, is that over the years, the, the relative power of the National Security Council and its staff, vis-a-vis -vis the Department of Defense or the State Department or other international organizations, has waffled around quite a bit. Depending on people. Right. And depending on the president. Exactly. The Office of Management, of, of, Office of Management Budget, this is from the memorandum, so it name is still as it was originally proposed, uh, consisted of these six divisions, and I won't go through them any more than I have, but needless to say, over the years, the legislative, le legislative and budgeting division has dominated. Information systems has gone away, executive personnel has never really done the job that was defined here. Program coordination exists and is effective sometime, but not often. Organization was intended to carry on the work of the Ash Council, basically. Right, keep to, evaluating. To keep evaluating how organizations were working and to keep on rationalizing them concentrating their, idea, their, their work around the idea of what is the objective that the government is trying to achieve but, with these organizations. But go to the domestic council. What was it supposed to do? Well, I just want to cover program evaluation for a minute, if I might. We've got a time problem. Then I won't cover program evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, domestic, the, the, the domestic council was intended to be the... Uh, the uh, analog of the National Security Council for domestic policy. Um, and it was supposed to have a staff of the same quality as the domestic, as the National Security Council. It was to be headed by the president, in his absence, the vice president, to have a very, very high level director, and did for some years have a very high level director. And its job was to essentially develop domestic policy, um, see that domestic policy into, uh, into uh, reality, and assign that the uh, implementation of that policy to the relevant department or agency that is responsible for And just to clarify, and unlike OMB, the National Security Council legally is the Secretaries of State and Defense, the head of the CIA, and the staff is the part on the White House, the separate budget, that does the analysis for the council. The council seldom meets. It's the staff that's doing the work. And the domestic council's the same thing. Andy said the president chairs it, it's the secretaries of all the domestic departments. But they almost never meet. The staff, separately budgeted, uh, on the White House, in the executive office of the president, does the analysis. And what we're going to see, and the seeds are here, we're going to give you a hint where we're going to end up, you're seeing the change from cabinet government, where the, the, the department heads in the, in the cabinet are running the substance, to a situation where the White House is running policy, in, uh, foreign policy or domestic policy, making the decisions, and then OMB is effectuating the policy. Now, let's go back for just a second. Wait, not, yeah. Okay. And th this change, uh, how hard was that to get that one passed? The OMB. The, the OMB Domestic Council, number two. Well, keep in mind that this. This became law unless it was vetoed by the Congress, the so-called negative veto. So what we had to do was go up and convince members of Congress to sit on their hands uh, in this one, or sit on their mouths. No, you can't sit on your mouth. But keep, um, uh, the head of the House Government Affairs Committee time was a Congressman named Hollifield, who came from Southern California. Chet Hollifield. Right. And the head of the Senate committee was Senator McClellan of Arkansas, who was a very cantankerous man. 
And I, I had to do this. And I had never done this before, and I was totally unknown to uh, any of these To guys. lobbying. You know, what I had going for me was a title and an office in the White House. And, but, you know, up on Capitol Hill, that, that doesn't amount to very much. Um, uh, and so I, uh, uh, Chet Hollifield and his staff uh, were not difficult in the sense that they were opposed, but they did want to know what it was all about and, and what they could expect it, how they could expect it would operate. And so that was a, those were substantive meetings, and there were two or three of them, principally with members of the staff, although there were an hour or two with the congressman. Senator McClellan was a whole different kettle of fish. Um, 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 I don't honestly believe that I convinced him of anything. He, he ended up taking no action, and so the, the plan became law. Um, I think that what happened with Senator McClellan um, I represented to Senator McClellan how the various members of the council, what their positions were. And of the members of the council, the one that Senator McClellan knew the best was Governor Conley. And I made some representations about Governor Conley's position that, um, that Governor Conley uh, Thought were, was overly enthusiastic? But he, it, I, I wasn't there, so I don't know, but I suspect that it was Governor Conley who got Senator McClellan not to take an, a position on this. Uh, but in the course of doing that, uh, I had obviously, at least according to Senator McClellan and subsequently Governor Conley, overstated my brief. And uh, Conley really dumped on me. I see. So it was, um, but it, but inaction occurred. Therefore, it, came, it became law. Yeah. And appointed to run OMB, the first director of OMB, George Schultz, probably the heaviest member of the cabinet, of Nixon's cabinet, former dean of the uh, Chicago Business School. And John Ehrlichman uh, took over domestic affairs and did the more political aspect. I mean, OMB was really substance. Uh, uh, and, and not uh, uh, cutting things because of political realities. Uh, and the Domestic Council was responsible for policy formulation. Uh, tell us about the other two, the other two acts that passed. Reorganization plans. Well, the, envir the Environmental Protection Agency is probably the organization for which the council is best known, if it's known for anything. Um, <clears throat> but it was very easy. There was a a, a, a great deal of interest in, uh, in this area, as there still is. Um, it, it, uh, there was almost no objection to it in Congress from either party, uh, although very shortly after the Environmental Protection Agency got into business, there was a hell of a lot of objection, and there still is. Um, so, um, and, and as you know, there are currently calls for eliminating it. <laughs> so, well, it gets in the way. Yeah. Uh, Bill Ruckel's house was the first uh, director, and we've, we've done a forum on EPA, and, and he has this wonderful story that, that he told, that, that he came over uh, uh, to the, the park across the street from the White House, sat on a bench with John Ehrlichman, and he said, you know, the way I read the law, I'm supposed to make the decision on whether DDT is a carcinogenic and, and whether we're going to ban it. And Ehrlichman said, yeah, that's the way I read the law, too. And, and he said, don't you guys want to know what I'm going to do? I mean, you know, if we ban this thing, there are going to be awfully awful lot of upset farmers and awful lot of upset people. Uh, and, and Ehrlichman, recounted by, uh, by Bill Ruckel's house, Ehrlichman said, your, your job, Bill, is to make that call. You, you don't have to clear it with us. That's, that's your job. And Bill said he was flabbergasted because they really wanted that call made on the merits. They didn't want to try to influence it. And, of course, uh, 
when it was made, it was hugely controversial, the first of many rulings by, uh, by EPA. Yeah, the, been. the important thing to keep in mind about EPA, I think, is that there isn't anything that it does, nothing that isn't controversial. Yes, um, yeah, because it has impacts. Yeah, and so as long as EPA has been in existence, and it's a long time now, it has always been in the middle of a con these controversies. And, and, and the agency has learned over the years, I think, how to deal with them. I mean, well, it probably has to be a renewed learning every once in a while. Yeah. It's a pretty, I think it's a pretty successful agency. It probably hasn't gone as far in its principal mission as, you know, environmentalists would like it to have gone. But it's gone a lot farther than we would have gone if it didn't exist. Absolutely. What about NOAA? Well, that's an interesting one because uh, NOAA had first been proposed by an entirely separate commission. Yes. Remember Stoddard, the, something the like Stratton that? The Stratton Commission. Stratton Commission. And, it, and the council bought the ideas, and, and after looking at it fairly carefully, and NOAA is a, is a part of the Department of Commerce, I believe, today. Um, and it's probably one of the more successful government organizations. But not controversial, to our knowledge. No. It's the Weather Service, it's the Coastal Survey, it's, it's a, it, it performs services and, and collects data, which is hugely important. Yeah, it's, and, yeah it, it is uncontroversial, un, un, un and, and, uh, and its constituency is national. I mean, it, I mean there, there are not strong independent constituencies. And, and just, to, just to review real quick, what you did was take a whole bunch of little uh, uh, components and con consolidate them into one organization and put it where it belonged yeah. in the department. And that's an important consideration because there were, and I've forgotten the number, but it was certainly 20 organizations spread out all over the government working in some t ways at cross purposes to one another um, and with very, very similar missions. So the basic concept of, you know, bringing organizations together that had related or similar or the same objectives really worked out very well in this case. Uh, but with regard to the, I think, the last slide that you've got. Right? Uh, uh, I, I want one more comment before we go. Uh, you, you, do you remember who you rec what departments you recommended NOAA go to? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't um, commerce. It, it was Interior. Yeah, that's right. Interior, the department that only deals with the domestic United States, was recommended to deal with everything outside the United States, the oceans and the atmosphere. Uh, but it was because that's what the Interior was good at. Uh, but then personalities became involved. Oh, that's right. If you go back, Wally Hickel, Hickel governor right. of Alaska, yeah. was running the Department of the Interior and had shown himself to be somewhat independent, had written the president a letter saying, you don't understand why the kids are upset about the Vietnam War, and maybe if you'd listen a little bit better, you'd be a better president. And, and uh, so Wally was kind of in the doghouse. And Maurice Stan, Secretary of Commerce, was not, and, and was the president's chief fundraiser, and, and uh, didn't cause waves. And amazingly, the Ash Council said, put it into the interior, and when reorg plan number four was actually proposed, it was proposed for commerce. Uh, these, these things happen with personality. You want to go on. Yeah, but the, the important thing to keep, from, from my perspective, the important thing is that, that you now had a rational agency, regardless, of, Absolutely. Where, regardless Absolutely. of where the hell it was. All right. We're going to cover these real quick because we're running short on time. There were three additional duties imposed on the Ash Council that had to do with crime and drugs. Uh, uh, the organized crime strike forces, the international trafficking in the narcotics, and drug abuse. And I'm going to cover those because I was around at the time and, and, and more involved in these. Um, the strike force issue is terribly uh, important because of organized crime. The issue was did you, did you have separate uh, uh, prosecutorial units in the big cities, or did you combine them in the Office of the United States Attorney? And, and, and the Ash Council 
said, no, you, you may house them together, but you want them to report back to the Department of Justice separately because pr prosecuting organized crime is a long-term proposition, and it, 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 it's not something where you want turnover in the staff and you want to have it directed from Washington. The international narcotics one had to do with uh, uh, efforts overseas to convince other companies to help us suppress narcotics traffic, and there was competition between the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs at the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Customs at the Department of Treasury. And this is one of the things that Congressman Tom Petri was, was so helpful in clarifying. If you read the document from the Ash Council, it says justice has prosecutorial authority. You ought to put this at BNDD, and Customs ought to do what BNDD leads. But Tom's memory was that the staff had come out the opposite way and said, no, Customs ought to take the lead. They're used to dealing with people overseas. That's why they're overseas in the first place. And, and Customs ought to have the lead. But again, personalities intervened. And John Mitchell was Secretary of the Department of Justice and a very powerful cabinet member. That, that's called Attorney General. Attorney General, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I make these mistakes. And. David Kennedy was Secretary of the Treasury. This is before John Connolly. And he was a banker from uh, uh, Continental Illinois Bank. So the members of the Ash Council said, no, 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 we're going to put this under the powerful guy, uh, 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 John, uh, John Mitchell. And then it turned out, the second bounce of the ball, we've got to switch from staff to council. But then when it went to implementation, it switched back because the head of BNDD was not cooperative, was not interested in, in the president making this a, a huge initiative, which Nixon wanted to do, but the commissioner of customs was. So this ended up as a special office in the executive office of the president run by the commissioner of customs who, who assumed the title uh, 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 the uh, 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 Drug Enforcement Administration. And it just shows, when you, when you read the documents, 50 years from now, when, when people aren't alive, like, like, like Andy and I, and you read the documents, you'll get the wrong impression of what really happened. What really happened was a double switch on this particular one. And then in treatment, it was the same thing. It was a very high priority to, to Nixon. So they did this. They brought this into the executive office of the president. Now, we'll go on. Well, I, I, I just stop. want to Let me Let me go back. make a, a, a point about these three memos. The, the, the resolution of these things, of these three areas, was typical of the, the way the government had behaved in the past and continues to behave. That is ad hoc solutions. Absolutely. For things without any, any, without any uh, organizational rationale behind them. They're very, very personality-driven. Um, and, for, for example, in one of the memos of the Ash Council, a much earlier one, that had to do with the executive office of the president, other than the pieces of it that we've just we've talked about earlier, we, the council made it very clear that things shouldn't be dumped into the executive office of the president, you know, willy-nilly. Just on a whim. Yeah, you know, on a whim. And here we are, a year later, dumping things into the executive office of the president. And that's still being done. And, and it's, it's done to give the, the, the issue visibility. It's done because of conflict between the departments. It's done because it's a particular interest of the president, or perhaps the president's chief of staff. And it's done on personality. Yeah, and it's done on the basis of personality, and it is wrong. It has been wrong, but it's always, but it's always done, um, uh, and it probably always will continue so, to be done. So, so to bring us t to speed, we, we have the Ash Council appointed to rationalize the executive office of the president, does a very good, thorough job, and says you can't organize by personality, you've got to organize by function, here's how you ought to do it. And then in the course of their work, they're assigned, tossed, three hot potatoes, political issues, uh, organized crime and, and international narcotics and treatment. And regardless of what they said, the president and his staff 
proceeded to do exactly what the Ash Council was, was hired not to do, to, to organize on the basis of personality and, and basically presidential priority. Nixon wanted a war on drugs. This was important to him. And so it, it ended up being very close. And it's a, it's, a, it's a perfect example of why problems don't remain solved. They, they are addressed, but there's natural inclinations that bring them back. When I go to the next slide, it'll start right away, so I've got to introduce it. <clears throat> Having reorganized the executive office of the president, the Ash Council went on and made recommendations about the entire executive branch, and that was redoing uh, cabinet departments. Now, they didn't have authority to do this by reorganization plan. They needed legislation. But Andy was brought onto the White House staff, onto the Domestic Council, uh, to help prepare and, and finalize recommendations to reorganize the entire executive branch, and it became a part of the President's State of the Union message in 1971, and what we've done, we've, we've isolated the segment where the President is in the, uh, uh, the, the, the House of Representatives where he, where he delivers the State of the Union, just like last night, where the President is talking about reorganizing the executive branch. So it, when I click, it starts. The sixth great goal is a complete reform of the federal government itself, based on a long and intensive study with the aid of the best advice obtainable, I have concluded that a sweeping reorganization of the executive branch is needed if the government is to keep up with the times and with the needs of the people. I propose, therefore, that we reduce the present 12 cabinet departments to eight. I propose that the departments of state, treasury, defense, and justice remain, but that all the other departments be consolidated into four. Human resources, community development, natural resources, and economic development. Let us look at what these would be. First, a department dealing with the concerns of people as individuals, as members of a family, a department focused on human needs. Second, a department concerned with the community, rural communities, and urban communities, and with all that it takes to make a community function as a community. And third, a department concerned with our physical environment, with the preservation and balanced use of those great natural resources on which our nation depends. And fourth, a department concerned with our prosperity, with our jobs, our businesses, and those many activities that keep our economy running smoothly and well. Under this plan, rather than dividing up our departments by narrow subjects, we would organize them around the great purposes of government. Rather than scattering responsibility by adding new levels of bureaucracy, we would focus and concentrate the responsibility for getting problems solved. With these four departments, when we have a problem, we will know where to go and the department will have the authority and the resources to do something about it. Over the years, we have added departments and created agencies at the federal level, each to serve a new constituency, to handle a particular task. And these have grown and multiplied in what has become a hopeless confusion of form and function. The time has come to match our structure to our purposes, to look with a fresh eye, to organize the government by conscious, comprehensive design to meet the new needs of a new era. I don't think the, the applause was quite that enthusiastic at the time. But what you had was one of the six goals of the uh, uh, State of the Union, and we've got the outline of the proposals. And this is where Andy uh, uh, went, went really beyond the Ash Council and achieved this uh, uh, conceptualization of how you'd reorganize <clears throat> two-thirds of the executive branch. They left the four core government departments across the top, state, justice, treasury, and defense, left them alone. But they consolidated under function the grant-making agencies of, of the federal government. Andy, you can walk us through those 
just the, the, the theory of the top four, because we, we got a little time problem. The theory of the top four? Of the, the, the bottom four, I'm sorry. Well, I, I mean, it's pretty obvious. I mean, if you, if you follow the logic of the creation of um, NOAA, you have the logic of the creation of these departments. There's a, there's a common, these are the four great domestic objectives. <clears throat> They will be around forever um, as necessary how you functions help and, of the, How you help and deal with individuals. Yeah, communities, individuals, the economy, and, and the natural resources. You know. um, and functions that, are, that were proposed to be consolidated, each of these departments were all over the federal government. So what you tried to create here was a set of rational departments uh, out of what was then and remains a quite irrational structure. But a structure which, as Jeff has pointed out earlier, is bolstered by tradition, by people, by vested interests, um, constituencies, and by uh, just the inertia of the of, of activities that have been done in a certain way for a long time. So could, could you say as an intellectual matter, organizing by function would be far more rational and perhaps far more efficient than organizing by special interest group and congressional committee? I have no doubt of that. It would be far more efficient, at least for some period of time. But this required real legislation, independent laws, yeah, actually, to be to not not vetoed, but but to be passed. Yeah, the laws went up and, not, uh, and obviously were buried immediately. So n nothing nothing happened with these. But the idea. Well, the idea survives. But fair enough. Fair enough. Right. Okay, we've gone through what the Ash Council did. That that it really did change the executive office of the president. It tried to address crime and Doug issues that got involved in politics. And, and there was an effort to go much further, and the effort founded, uh, founded be, be, because it was, it was a bridge too far. It was, it was too much. But what we have, and we, we show this on the, uh, on the last slide, I have done two dozen of these forums, and we've done five of them already on implementation of Ash Council efforts. Uh, we, we, we did one uh, uh, way back in 2007 on drug treatment. We did one on the d creation of the Domestic Council uh, in 2010, on the environment uh, later in 2010, on organized crime, how, how uh, those strike forces were so successful, and one on the Office of Telecommunications Policies. And then if you go down to the bottom, what you have is one coming up uh, in April of this year where we're just going to focus on OMB and how the, the, the effort was and, and matured in, in putting uh, management into budget. I want to thank you for coming. Uh, those of us who dwell in the sphere of policy uh, uh, really, really enjoy knowing the background of the people and the contributions that are made on these Nixon uh, leg legislative and policy initiatives. Thank you very much for coming.